<laughs> You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. Uh, my guest today is New York Times bestselling author, Susan Wilson. And Susan's here to talk to us today about her latest release, The Dog Who Danced. Wonderful, wonderful novel, and uh, we we'll look forward to talking to Susan a little bit more about that and actually ask her a little bit more about her writing techniques and what goes into that, too. So we're going to come back with Susan on that. So everybody, hold tight. We're going to break for some commercial messages. We'll be right back with Susan Wilson right after the messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Petco, where the pets go. Petco, where the pets go. Pet Life Radio has tail wagging, fur flying, fabulous deals for our listeners from Petco. Get six dollars off your order of sixty dollars or more, and up to forty percent off the entire Petco site. That's right. But that's not all. Because you're a Pet Life Radio listener, you'll also get free shipping on your order of forty nine dollars or more. Six dollars off, up to forty percent off, and free shipping from Pet Life Radio and. Petco. To get these awesome deals, go to PetcoDeals.com. That's PetcoDeals.com. Petco. Where the pets go. Betty White wants the number one pet radio network in the world. Pet Life Radio. Season Milan, the dog whisperer. What radio network has over 5 million monthly listeners and over 50 pet talk shows? Pet Life Radio. Rachel Ray, where is the best place to reach potential customers if you have a pet business? Pet Life Radio. Put your business in front of over 5 million pet parents with a radio ad on Pet Life Radio, the award winning number one pet radio network on the planet. Call our sales department today. Toll free at 877 385 8882. That's 877 385 8882. Or email us at sales at petliferadio.com. Steve Wozniak, if Apple was a pet business, where would you advertise your eyelash? On Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets on petliferadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so excited to uh, introduce Susan Wilson and uh, talk to her about her recently released book, The Dog Who Danced. Susan, welcome to Animal Rights on well, Pet Life Radio. Well, thank you, Tim, very much. It's, it's quite an honor to be uh, on Animal Rights. This is terrific. Well, our pleasure, a pleasure. Congratulations on another uh, great book, great release. Thank you. Yeah, tell everybody a, a little bit about the, uh, the Dog Who Danced. Well, The Dog Who Danced is essentially the story of divided loyalties, if you will. We have Justine Mead, who is a 40-something woman who's kind of had a you know, a tough life and has made some decisions that have been probably not the best that she could have made. And she's kind of wandered around the, the country. And uh, her her constant and most devoted companion is her Sheltie, who she calls Mac, and with whom she uh, practices something called canine freestyle, which is also known as dog dancing, which if you've ever <laughs> looked at YouTube videos, I mean, there are dogs that dance, but this is an actual, almost an agility kind of uh, style, very formal kind of a, of a, an event. And uh, she is called back to New Bedford, where her father is and her stepmother, and she hasn't got a lot of money, so she takes a ride with a, uh, a gypsy trucker. And uh, the upshot of the, of the beginning of the book is that he abandons her at a rest stop because she takes a little too long and unknowingly takes her dog with him and they are separated, Justine and Mac. And Artie, who is the evil direct driver, eventually discovers the dog in his in his truck and kicks him out, literally kicks him out of the truck. And the dog is basically about four or five hundred miles away from his owner and wants to obviously be reunited. He is found by a couple who are in a mid you know, early 60s, probably a little late 50s, early 60s, and they've had a uh, a life tragedy that has served to essentially separate them emotionally, if not physically. And Matt comes into their life, and they they keep him, and they become very fond of him. And slowly, Mac begins to knit them back together. So at the end, of course, the great question: the divided loyalties is 
with whom does Mac belong? And it was a really hard question to answer. Wow, amazing. I just, I, you know, being a writer and uh, publishing books, uh, you know, myself, it's always fascinating when I talk to someone who puts together a novel because I, I can imagine what's going through your mind. You know, I'm assuming you pull some from real life, uh, true life experiences or things you've heard, but how do you actually put all that together? Because that's a pretty wild story. Well, I tell you, it's, I don't know how we do it. <laughs> Essentially, it just happens. No, it does. I mean, obviously, you, you plot a little bit and you know a theme you want to follow and all of that. Um, and as, as follow, you know, as people say, well, you base this on actual things or life. Uh, I always say that, you know, everything goes into the hopper and how it comes out is just fiction. So, uh, you know, have I actually had that experience? No. Did I read Jack London's wonderful story, Brown Wolf? Yes, I did. And uh, as a child, and that I don't know if you're familiar with it, is sure. essentially that, where, they, where the, the uh, sled dog is found by a, a couple who tame him, and then his uh, rightful owner shows up, and the dog is made to decide. And it was just such an affecting book for me as a kid, but that was kind of the theme that was going on in my mind when I wrote The Dog Who Danced. Absolutely. And so we'll learn more about Mac in the book, but tell us a little bit about Mac, who's a, he said, a Shetland sheepdog. And uh, I think his purpose and mission, from what I uh, read into it, was uh, he really does bring everybody together, bring the family unit together, or bring an individual to their, their best. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about Mac. About Mac, well, he's, when I was trying to come up with the correct breed of dog for this, this character, and, and the dog really is a character. You know, I toyed with various kinds of an Australian sheepdog, border collie, and it just kept coming back to I needed, as they are very intelligent, very active dogs, they're also dogs that are so busy. (laughs) I needed a dog that could kind of be tempered back a little bit. And so, you know, I've I've known Shetland sheepdogs, certainly, and they seem, they've got the qualities of great intelligence. They're herd dogs, and herd dogs want people to be together. That's what they like. They like people together. And they were also very good in agility. So with those three things going for them, plus the fact that I I like the breed, it was it was pretty easy to put a a little Mac Sheltie dog in there. Yeah, and it makes sense. It makes sense, and I love how you know that's one thing that I think I want all the listeners to sort of as they're writing their books and as they're writing their stories to really realize that you know though these things come to our you know a a writer's mind and and you throw them in the hopper as you had mentioned, you still have to do your homework. This wouldn't have quite been the same story if this would have been a, uh, a bulldog or a, uh, no. a, little, <laughs> a little pug dog. <laughs> I, I don't think it could have been, yes, it couldn't have been a dog that's, you know, more self-interested. Shetland sheepdogs are for their people, you know. That's Carriers, right. Carriers, they tend to be more self-interested. Exactly. So it's good to, I mean, it's a good fit, and I think I applaud you for doing your research on that. Thank Tell you. us a little bit about, you know, how did the book come about? I mean, was there a, a certain time that these ideas started coming about, or did you pull from, obviously, we know of your, uh, your best-selling book, One Good Dog, mm-hmm. which is a fantastic read. Thank you. Uh, did you pull from that as well? How did, how did that all come about? Well, it is essentially, you know, I had finished One Good Dog, and once you've finished one, there, you know, your people in New York are saying, <laughs> well, what's next? And they clearly exactly. wanted to, you know, the the dog thing, as uh, you know, as I, I always quote Shakespeare in love, you know, you got to have a bit with a dog to be successful. And, and clearly that had worked for me. And it's also something that I've got a tremendous amount of pleasure doing. And so when they said, you know, we really want you to, to have another book with a dog featured in, and I said, yeah, sure, let's do that. And then, yeah, I, I tend to um, bounce ideas off my agent. My agent has been a, a wonderful bastion of, of support for me for many, many years, and You know, I I will run four or five or six story ideas past her, and she will, you know, mull them over, and we'll talk back and forth, and eventually what comes out is the book. The the initial part of it, the proposal, as we say, will come out of those conversations. And I liked the idea of, you know, somebody who is kind of their own worst enemy and who has made decisions and still kind of points backwards and blames other people, learning something, and that was probably one of the, the paramount themes in there is that Justine at the end of the day actually has to learn something about herself and about her past that she has kind of decided how things were and uh, you know so that was kind of a the theme that I was going for and also the exploration of a loss of a child which frankly was the hardest part of that book to write because I didn't really want to write that that what I tried to mightily to come up with something else that had happened but that's what evolved and that's what became what sounded the most believable and understandable is that they had lost their daughter, and that was fairly hard. 
yeah, it's a great twist for the book. It's it's very tragic, and when you first look at the book, you know the cover. The cover is fantastic. And you think, okay, it's an, a great story about a dog, mm. and it's really more about a story about life in general and how to overcome things. And and uh, the dog Mac obviously helps pull things together. And I think dogs and animals in general have that ability. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what accounts for so many dogs who are considered therapy dogs. Uh, and that whole whole idea now that that there is something to having an animal in nursing homes and working with uh, people with uh, post traumatic stress, uh, you know, all of that. I mean, they really are blood pressure lowerers, and they're great. They really are having one, <laughs> having had several. Absolutely, yeah, they are. They're great healers, great teachers, and there's always a particular reason that they uh, come into our lives. We just have mm-hmm. to open ourselves up to it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, the best life to have is a dog's life. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, mine in particular. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, my, my mother-in-law always says when she comes back around next time, she wants to be one of our pets. So. <laughs> <laughs> my husband always says, if I had four legs, I'd get dinner on time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about me. <laughs> That's right. All right, fantastic. Well, we're going to take a quick break uh, okay, as we come good. back. We're going to uh, continue our conversation with Susan Wilson uh, right after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Every pet is unique. Maybe they're gray in the muzzle, yet young at heart. Maybe they're growing out of the puppy stage and into their paws and ears. Or maybe they're just trying to maintain a more girlish figure. At PetSmart, we have the right food for your pet at a great value for you. PetSmart. Be better together. Go to PetSmartDeal.com and save up to 30% on awesome gifts for the pets and pet people in your life. Toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. Go to PetSmartDeal.com today. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership Plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to audibledeals.com. That's audibledeals.com. I don't make any decisions about who to hire without going to Angie's List first. You'll find reviews on home repair to health care written by people just like you. With Angie's List, I know who to call, and I know the results will be fantastic. Angie's List, who you can trust. Go to Angie'sList.com forward slash rights and get 25% off any subscription. That's Angie'sList.com forward slash rights, W-R-I-T-E-S. Hello, I'm Deborah Wolf, and I'm inviting you to my animal party on Pet Life Radio. The dress code? Come as you are. Pajamas, a tux, you can even go naked like your pets. Unleash your party animal at my animal party. Guests you know from Animal Planet, TV, radio, the news, and bookstores will be joining me. And that's because after I won Best Pet Radio in America from the DWAA, I got my paw in the door and I met a lot of amazing people. And the best of the best are going to be coming to the party. They're coming to party with us. So join us at the animal party. Don't miss the party. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. 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 Welcome back. Welcome back. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm here with author Susan Wilson. 
talk to her about her latest release, The Dog Who Danced. Now, Susan, I know like me, your uh, writing process starts with a good cup of coffee. So I read that. I did my research and homework on you. And I, I agree, I can't get anywhere without my coffee, especially in the morning. But I want you to tell us a little bit more about your writing process. Do you have a, a structured routine that you follow on a daily basis? Or is it more of a, you know, when you get some great ideas, you sit down and, and put them on paper or as we call it? Actually, yes, I do have a very structured writing routine because, you know, it's it's fine to write when the when the spirit moves you. But when you're a professional and under deadline quite often and with expectations of other people, uh, you have to do the job. And, you know, I so often have people say to me, oh, I'd love to write a book. And I always say, well, sit down, <laughs> write it. <laughs> we can walk around all you want. But, uh, you know, it, all kidding aside, I, I do, you know, start with the coffee and then I, I read for, you know, hopefully an hour, uh, because I do feel as though reading is as important a part of writing as anything. It's uh, writing readiness, as they say in the English high school biz, kind of gets you going a little bit, and you, you need to see what else is out there and how people are doing things. Yeah. And then I sit down and, and work for a couple of hours, and then uh, pretty much that's all the stamina I have. Uh, two hours is, is pushing it, and then uh, you know I let it simmer and take my dog for a walk. Let me ask you then, you said you, you started off by reading. What are you mm-hmm. reading? Are you, are you doing research for the novel you're writing? Are you reading the, the events going on in the world? Or are you doing things just to sort of open up your mind and get those reading, writing juices flowing? Right. Mostly the latter. I'm, I'm a huge, this will surprise you, a huge reader of fiction. And I really, you know, I just enjoy it. And right now I am reading a biography. And, you know, frankly, I keep thinking, well, now if you just did this, it would be interesting and exciting. <laughs> I want to fictionalize the whole thing because it's really flat. But, um, no, I mostly read fiction. And I, I you know, t- try to read people who are, shall we call them the upper crust. And then I sometimes, you know, when you just need some mind candy, you might read somebody who's, you know, not there and uh, just for pure entertainment. But, uh, you know, I do like to try and, you know, read the, the people who are, are mentioned and, you know, the, the good reviews and things like that, and people who have been recommended. I, I find that um, somebody who can give you a good recommendation is, should be listened to, and that's what I try to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's interesting you said, you know, you really sit down for a couple of hours, and that's about it. You know, that's all you can you can handle and you walk away from it. Because I think a lot of people, uh, you know, when I talk to, to writers and authors, they oftentimes feel guilty if they, A, aren't structured in their day, or B, they, they're not spending, you know, eight hours, the eight-hour yeah. work day typing yeah. and, and writing and stuff. And I think it is overload after a while. It, it is. It is. It's absolutely exhausting. I mean, there have been days, of, you know, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, okay, I'm taking a nap. Um, now, when it comes to revising, on the other hand, I can do eight hours because that to me is the most fun. The original draft is the hardest thing of all because you don't know your characters. You don't know where you're going half the time. And all of a sudden you get to the end and you think, huh, I don't know about this. Start over. And because you know where you've gone, you need to, you can figure out how to make it more interesting and throw in a little of that foreshadowing stuff and, and all of that. And that to me, that's, that's golden. I, I can do that all day long. Yeah, and to me that I mean I think one of the hardest things, especially when you're talking about writing fiction, writing you know writing a novel, after you've got it all put together, you know you're pretty much at the end of it, going back through it, and make sure okay, what did I miss? You know <laughs> what doesn't make sense? How did that guy get from point A to point B? Exactly. What happened to the dog in between these you know, pages? Yeah. Two hundred or whatever and, happened to whatever I was doing there? My God, I put that you know I put that coffee cup down and I never picked it up again. You know, <laughs> it was uh, John Gardner, I think, who. Um, it was John Gardner. No, yes, John Gardner who wrote, uh, you know, um, Grendel and, and all of that, and like October Light. And he, of course, is, you know, anybody who's studied fiction at all has read his art of fiction and the art of the novel. But he, he talks about when he was writing a cocktail party scene and his main character had to either take or not take an hors d'oeuvre. And it drove him crazy. He couldn't figure it out. And he had to walk away from it because he couldn't decide whether his character was going to do that or not. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you got to walk away, take a breath, go yeah. take the dog for a walk. I think it's take always the dog it. for a walk. Go out there and get some exercise. And that's right. Get some exercise. Great meditation time too to go out <laughs> oh, for a is. walk. It is, and that's when you know things will bubble up to the surface. But it is like you say in the revising where you suddenly pick up. Oh, we had blue eyes in this scene and green in the next. And, that's right. You know, so do I write him that. now with uh, contact lenses that change his colors, or do I change? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, Susan, yeah. after our listeners read uh, The Dog Who Danced, give me an idea of what would be the main thing you would like the readers to walk away from uh, after reading the book. Hmm. 
Well, I think mainly that they've they've enjoyed it. Uh, I think that it's not, you know, there's no overt message, life message in it, except that uh, you need to be open-minded and maybe to not be judgmental and maybe to soften up a little bit in your life in order to be happy. But I think mostly what I want my readers to do is to to come to the end of a book and say, wow, I really liked that. It was satisfying. I liked how it ended. I liked the characters. This is a character I'd want to know. Absolutely. And that's uh, definitely something you've accomplished in The Dog Who Dance. So you could well, do a good job with that. Now, Susan, in addition to writing uh, numerous novels, obviously, we talked about a couple of them on here, mm-hmm. but you also write for newspapers, right? Newspaper column. I do occasionally. I, it started off being every other week, which became, and this is sort of before I was actually, you know, under contract and, and doing a lot more with the fiction. The local newspaper editor was kind enough to say, how would you like to write a column on writing? And I said, oh, okay. And we negotiated that. And over time, I've just had too much else going on, and the, and the books have really just been my whole life. So I've, I'm now down to a when I feel like it kind of column, which is really <laughs> nice. It's like, oh, here, take this. I, I just tossed this off. You know, it's a little bit like having a blog because you, you really are on around to fulfill that commitment. And frankly, that's not my favorite kind of writing. It's hard. And it, it's, um, and I, you know, at first I was really kind of nervous about it because I'm like, you know, people know me. What are they going to think about my thoughts? And, you know, people are very kind, of course. But it, it was hard work. It really was. Yeah. I'm really glad to have it ad hoc. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a great way to go. You know, but what are the differences that you would find when writing an article, especially when you, back in the days when you had to write on a, a regular basis, because uh, I'm yeah. sure they were expecting it. How does that whole process work compared to uh, sending out and putting together all the details in, that goes into a novel? Well, I tell you, it, that's why I say it's really hard. First, mm. you got to come up with an idea. It's kind of like writing a sermon. That's the only other thing I can equate it to. You have to have a reason to write it, and you don't have 300 pages to explicate that reason. you got to make your point in about seven paragraphs, and you got to have a reason. You know, and I, you know, I could have a great thesis topic sentence, but then you got to come around to completing that thought, and that was like, okay, <laughs> I've got this really great two paragraphs. Where can I go from there? Most of what I, I ended up basing my column on was uh, language, which is very important to me, obviously, and oddly enough, punctuation, which is equally important. And mm-hmm. one of my all-time favorite columns was on the art of the semicolon. And I still get people talking to me about that. <laughs> it, was, it was really, it was tongue-in-cheek. It was totally tongue-in-cheek. And most of the column was. I think that's one of the other differences between my column and the, the novels is that the columns tend to be funny, and the novels never are. And it was kind of fun to... To say things that were, you know, a little silly. Right, and, and it shows your your personality off, I think, as well. Which is more my personality than the weepies, but uh, eh, anyway, they're, they're uh-huh. fun to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think that it is two totally different types of, of writing and there's different pressures. They both have their own set of pressures and, but how you go about handling it, the deadlines, how do you handle mm-hmm. uh, condensing things uh, for an article compared to a, a novel? They both have their fair share of challenges. Oh, yeah. But again, it's a good exercise. It certainly is in brevity and different voice. And also because I put things in my novel that I would never either say or do. And in the column, I knew I was going to run into, you know, somebody who reads it in the grocery store and the post office and down the street, and they were going to call me on it. So I needed to be, you know, to my own self be true kind of a thing. I needed to be me. I couldn't make stuff up. That was part of it. I couldn't make stuff up, (laughs) which is what I do for a living. (laughs) So you got to be yourself but not be yourself at the same time. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. What persona am I going to put out there? So. It was it was fun. I owe them another one. I know I do. It's been a while. They're very patient with me. Uh, very good. Very good. Well, I want everybody to uh, obviously pick up a copy of The Dog Who Danced, and it's out on uh, audio as well. So yes. everybody can pick up it's, a copy. Uh, of you- Macmillan Audio, and it's available for ebook format and probably got large print out there too. I guess. <laughs> it's, it's everything. <laughs> Hit all the markets. Where can uh, our listeners learn more about uh, The Dog Who Danced and all your other wonderful uh, work that you do? Well, they can visit my website, which I will say is about to come back live. It's been under construction, so be patient. And that is SusanWilsonWrites.com. And that's W-R-I-T-E-S, kind of like... Animal rights, exactly. Exactly. Very, very (laughs) clever of us. Uh, They can certainly visit my website. Visit me on Facebook. Look up Susan Wilson Author on Facebook and 
like meat. And I am now, I'm told, on something called Tumblr, and I have no idea what that really is, but <laughs> the wonderful and, and no doubt very young people at St. Martin's have put me on that and on their website as well, St. Martin's okay. Press. Very good. So learn more about the book, uh, The Dog Who Danced. Uh, find out more about Susan and all of her other wonderful writings by uh, liking her on Facebook. You can go to SusanWilsonWrites.com and pick up a copy of the book. You will be very well entertained and learn all about Mac, our wonderful uh, Shetland Sheepdog. So, Susan, thanks for coming on the Animal Rights Show today. I really appreciate it, and we look forward to hearing from you uh, more in the future. Well, I certainly appreciate your having me on. This has been terrific fun. Oh, our I pleasure. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to the podcast. Very good. All right, Tim. All right. That's Susan Wilson, uh, the author of The Dog Who Danced. So uh, make sure you guys pick up a copy of that. And we'll be entertained as always. So we're coming to the end of the show today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I'd also like to thank our sponsors and producers for making this show possible. To find out more about me, Tim Link, and other guests that I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show and the stories in my blog, you can go to PetLifeRadio.com. It's PetLifeRadio.com. Click on the Animal Rights icon and you can listen and download all the wonderful interviews and uh, download the podcasts and download the blogs as well. And while you're at it, uh, be sure to check out all the other wonderful hosts on Pet Life Radio. It's PetLifeRadio.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show, please email me. You can email me at tim at petliferadio.com. That's tim at petliferadio.com. And I'll be glad to answer your questions, entertain your comments, and try to bring on the authors and writers and bloggers you want to hear most on the Animal Rights Show. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Share it in a blog, article, or in a book. And who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.